on World News Tonight. Putin response. Russian president asserts that he had deliberately led 24-hour mutiny by the Wagner militia go on to avoid bloodshed and that it had reinforced national unity. Calls for precautions. Regions of Pakistan face major inconveniences following severe three months in rainfall that flooded its streets. Massive fires. Fires break out in the high-rise residential apartment in the United Arab Emirates. And pretty in pink. Highly anticipated Barbie movie breathes life into the iconic dollhouse. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Shanali. Good evening and you are watching World News this Tuesday night and we start with Pakistan today as the country encounters pre-monsoon rains. Rainfall lashed several regions of Punjab including Lahore, giving a sign of relief to people amid ongoing heat spell. But the downpour led to stagnant water collecting in low-lying areas of the metropolis. After a few hours of rain, the city of Lahore was submerged in water. Several feet of water accumulated on the roads in different parts of the city. The vehicles and motorcycles of the citizens got stuck in the rainwater due to which the citizens are facing agonizing problems. There is anger against the city administration for not taking drainage measures despite the advance notice from the meteorological department. Due to heavy rain, the roof of a house collapsed due to which a mother and two children died. At least 10 people were killed and six others injured after lightning struck several parts of Pakistan's Punjab province. The fatalities were reported in the Sheikhpura and Narawal districts, where the lightning struck several houses after heavy rainfall. The area of Khalik Nagar, Yohanabad, which suffered from administrative inattention, became a hotbed of problems after the rain. Residents of the area were busy dewatering the water accumulated in the streets and houses on their own that furthered the public's dismay. Civil Protection Forces searched for trapped victims underneath the rubble of a collapsed 13-storey building in northern Egypt. The Egyptian Public Prosecution Office has ordered an investigation into the incident which took place in the Sidi Bashir area of Alexandria. At least four people were taken to nearby hospitals with injuries. Major General Mohammed Al Sharif, the governor of Alexandria, said that the building on Khalil Hamada Street had a vertical split. Eyewitnesses said a number of cars that were beneath the building at the time were destroyed in the incident. According to the latest Global Humanitarian Assistance report, North Korea ranks amongst the world's neediest in the terms of humanitarian support. Experts say efforts from both regime and the international community are crucial to solve the problem. More than 10 million people living in North Korea are in need of humanitarian assistance. That's according to the Voice of America citing the British Development Initiative's Global Humanitarian Assistance Report for the year 2023. The report says that as of last year, some 10,400,000 residents in the North are in need of external support, meaning North Korea ranks 14th on the list of countries with the most people in need. The regime has been listed along with Syria, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Afghanistan and Venezuela as having more than 10 million people suffering from humanitarian crisis since 2019. It has also been classified by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization's IPC standards as being at level P3+. IPC stands for the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification, a set of standards used to classify the severity and magnitude of food insecurity. Phase 3 means that some 20% of households are not consuming enough food and have high levels of malnutrition. North Korea has been consistently non-transparent regarding the level of humanitarian aid required there, despite the regime experiencing chronic food shortages over the past years. And for the situation to improve, experts say the North must allow international aid organizations to help, especially when it comes to providing food. Russian President Vladimir Putin made a defiant televised address, saying that he had deliberately let mutiny of the Wagner militia go on as long as it did to avoid bloodshed. In his first public comment since the end of a short-lived rebellion inside his country over the weekend, a defiant Russian President Vladimir Putin on Monday condemned the armed mutiny by Wagner mercenaries 
and at the same time said he had deliberately let the 24-hour revolt go on as long as it did to avoid bloodshed and that it had reinforced national unity. This civil solidarity has shown that any blackmail, any attempt to create internal turmoil is doomed to failure. I repeat, we saw the greatest consolidation of society. Putin did acknowledge there was bloodshed in the weekend rebellion, but blamed it on the Wagner group. The organizers of the rebellion, having betrayed their country, their people, also betrayed those whom they dragged into the crime. They lied to them, pushed them towards death, under fire, to shoot their own people. It was precisely this outcome, fratricide, that Russia's enemies wanted. Both the neo-Nazis in Kyiv and their Western masters, and all sorts of national traitors. They wanted Russian soldiers to kill each other. The televised statement appeared intended to draw a line under the mutiny, which numerous Western leaders saw as exposing Putin's vulnerability since invading Ukraine. Earlier on Monday, U.S. President Joe Biden said he spoke with key allies about the uprising to make sure everyone was coordinated in their response. They agreed with me that we had to make sure we gave Putin no excuse. Let me emphasize, we gave Putin no excuse to blame this on the West or to blame this on NATO. We made clear that we were not involved. We had nothing to do with it. This was part of a struggle within the Russian system. Biden's message that the West was not involved was sent directly to the Russians through various diplomatic channels, according to White House National Security Spokesperson John Kirby. We had good uh, direct communications with the Russians over the course of the weekend. It's our expectation that that would be able to continue going forward. It's just too soon to know after the weekend's events where Wagner goes as an entity um, uh, or where, where Mr. Prigozhin goes in terms of his leadership of it. Yevgeny Prigozhin, who leads the Wagner group, said the rebellion which he called a march for justice was intended to remove corrupt and incompetent Russian commanders, including Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, who he blames for botching the war in Ukraine. At around 11 p.m. Moscow time, Putin was shown on television addressing a meeting with the heads of his security departments, including Shoigu, but Putin did not mention any planned personnel changes at the Defense Ministry. Japan's release of wastewater from Fukushima is drawing closer as reports say that the underwater tunnel to be used to discharge it has been completed. The underwater tunnel that Japan is planning to use this summer to release wastewater from its destroyed Fukushima nuclear power plant is now complete. According to Fukushima Central Television, excavators used to dig the tunnel for a pipeline were removed Monday morning with the help of a large crane. The completion comes after a one-day delay, as the Tokyo Electric Power Company suspended the withdrawal on Sunday due to high seas. Japan's Nuclear Regulation Authority is scheduled to conduct a final check on Wednesday to ensure that all facilities for the wastewater release function properly. TEPCO began a trial run of those facilities, including the one-kilometer-long underwater tunnel, on June 12th. As far as we know, that test run will likely conclude tomorrow on Tuesday. It's widely expected Japan will discharge the wastewater treated by its advanced liquid processing system after the International Atomic Energy Agency clears it with a soon-to-be-released report on the issue. Public anxiety over the safety of the wastewater release lingers in South Korea, though, prompting the government to hold daily weekday briefings since June 15th in an effort to keep the people updated and informed on what will happen moving forward. Fielding questions on Monday, First Vice Minister of Government Policy Coordination, Park Kuyeon, told reporters that the currently adopted method of releasing the wastewater into the sea was final. He added that reversing the plan to go back to the stage of negotiating other methods of disposal with Japan and the international community, such as solidifying the water, was not an option at this point. The current plan of discharging the water was finalized following discussions with the IAEA after it was judged to be the most realistic, given safety considerations and scientific precedents. 
We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Now, Prince William is following the footsteps of his mother, late Princess Diana, as he launched a major five-year campaign to end homelessness, which he says should not exist in the modern and progressive society. Six locations in two days as the Prince of Wales launches his life's ambition, a plan to end homelessness. I first visited a homelessness shelter when I was 11 with my mother. The visits we made together left a deep and lasting impression. Over the next five years, we have a unique opportunity to develop innovative new solutions and scale their tangible impact. This will inspire belief throughout the UK and beyond that homelessness can be ended for good. Newport in South Wales is one of the six areas targeted by the project. Stuck in a cycle of temporary housing, Wayne's been homeless here for over a decade. Nearly eight years clean, and but I'm still struggling with homelessness regarding to get a flat. So basically, I'm in uh, a pod. It's a, like a shipping container. I'm just waiting on the council now to basically move me forward to get a, uh, my own property, basically. And that's what I'm heading for, and hopefully get a, a full-time job. All Wayne wants is a home, but it's years away. And after so long waiting, he doesn't think homelessness will ever end. Look how long it's been trying to get rid of homelessness. No, no offence, I don't think we'll ever get rid of homelessness. But I, w I wish we could, but it's not going to happen. With well-known faces, the Prince's Project will collaborate and convene to find local solutions to end homelessness. A bold pledge, say some, given his position of enormous privilege. It is a political issue for a prince who sits above politics. But he says it's not about policy, just action and positive change. Pfizer said that it would move forward with an oral version of an Ozempic-like drug candidate and abandon another as the competition heats up for a pill version of widely popular weight loss drugs. Pfizer said on Monday it is scrapping the development of obesity and diabetes drug Lotigliprol to focus on other treatments. That as the drug maker races to develop a rival to weight loss drugs from Danish company Novo Nordisk, which have seen soaring demand. Pfizer said it chose to discontinue the drug after results showed elevated levels of liver enzymes in patients during clinical trials. It will now focus on its other weight loss drug, Danugliprol. Latest trials show it helps type 2 diabetes patients lose weight, on par with rivals in a mid-stage study. Pfizer said it would finalise plans for the late-stage trial of Danugliprol by the end of 2023. Drug makers have been racing to target the weight loss market, which is estimated to reach $100 billion by the end of the decade. And Novo Nordisk is already testing a high-dose oral version of semaglutide, a drug behind brands Ozempic and Wegovi. Late-stage trials found that the obesity pill helped patients lose 15% of their body weight. The company has struggled to keep up with huge demand for Ozempic and Wegovi, which are sold as a once-weekly injection. It plans to seek approval for the pill version later this year and said the market launch is yet to be determined. The government of Honduras has announced a crackdown on organized crime within the Central American country's prison system after an attack in the women's penal center left 46 people dead last week. The following visuals of this story is graphic. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. Honduras's military began taking control of the country's violent prisons on Monday, according to officials. The move comes after a gang dispute left 46 inmates dead at a women's detention center last week. The high-security Tamara prison shown here is one of two that military police now control. Colonel Fernando Munoz told reporters that the weapons and ammo shown here were seized from only one area in the prison controlled by the Barrio 18 gang and accounted for only 5% of total inspections. Although the official capacity of the prison is 2,500, 
More than 4,200 people are crammed into this facility. A United Nations report said that the country's 26 prisons are around 34 percent over capacity. Some on the streets of the capital told the military control doesn't go far enough to stop the violence. I think that the new measures have to be put in place. First of all, the prisons have to be restructured. New jails have to be built. Also, to train and educate the staff working in the prisons and a new army, because the police and the army are complicit in this violence. The takeover is part of a push by leftist President Xiomara Castro to eliminate organized crime inside prisons and a departure from her previous stance of demilitarization. The images resemble those from El Salvador earlier this year, where the government has beefed up prison security and locked up more than 62,000 alleged criminals in a crackdown on gangs. The actors Ryan Reynolds and Rob McKinney, flush with the success they have brought to Wrecking Football Club, are expanding their sporting portfolio with investment at the Alpine Formula One team. They've already shaken up the lower reaches of UK soccer. Now Hollywood actors Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney have their eyes on Formula One. The pair are joining an investor group taking a 24% stake in Alpine Racing. That's according to a Monday statement from Renault, which is the parent firm of the British-based team. Other entities involved include US investor Redbird Capital Partners, which last year bought Italy's storied AC Milan soccer club. Alpine last won the F1 Constructors title back in 2006, when it was branded as the Renault Works team. It is currently fifth in this year's contest. Reynolds and McElhenney took over lowly Wrexham Soccer Club back in 2020. They have won the passionate support of local fans after an initially sceptical welcome. Their backing helped the team return to the English Football League this year after languishing at a lower level. The docu-series Welcome to Wrexham has also proved a big hit in North America, propelling the little-known club onto the global stage. Now they hope to drive a revival at Alpine too. The new investment is meant to help the team to again become a serious contender for titles within a few years. Welcome back to World News tonight and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. A 290 million settlement between America's largest bank and accusers of Jeffrey Epstein was given preliminary approval by a US judge. The accusers are women who say Epstein abused them that JP Morgan Chase turned a blind eye to the late finances sex trafficking. A thousand Palestinians were granted a free trip to perform Hajj by Saudi Arabia's King Salman bin Abdulaziz. King Salman has been making the gesture for over a decade to those impacted by the conflict with Israel. A growing number of Iraqis are turning to cheaper natural remedies as they've been priced out of healthcare. Iraq's healthcare system was once one of the best in the Middle East. Canada officially marks its worst wildfire season on record with smoke of the blazes crossing the Atlantic Ocean and reaching Western Europe. Canada is grappling with an alarming surge in forest fires. Former Odibaz Rupert Stadler was handed a suspended sentence of one year and nine months by Munich court for fraud by negligence in the 2015 diesel scandal, becoming the first former Volkswagen board member to receive such a sentence. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we finish off in California as Barbie's iconic Malibu dream house is making a return in real life with a three-story look-alike mansion that mirrors the set of Warner Brothers' upcoming Barbie movie made available for booking again by a vacation rental firm Airbnb. Stay safe and have a good night.